Hi there, my name is Eric Schultes. I'm with the GoFair Foundation, and I would like to give you a brief introduction today uh, to the topic of implementing the FAIR guiding principles. Real quick, I would just like to make sure that I acknowledge that this presentation was built very much in collaboration with Barbara Magana, also at the GoFair Foundation, and that uh, the two of us have built out something called the GoFair Foundation Capacity Building Program. So there's a, actually a, a formal training program where you can learn more about the things we talk about and cover here. Uh, so let's go uh, into this idea of FAIR. It is an acronym. Uh, it's for data and services that are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, not only for people, but also more and more for machines. So that's to say that uh, the FAIR principles are really about automating the FAINR operations uh, so that people don't have to do so much of that work themselves and that there's a lot less data munging that's required. Um, let me give you a brief introduction or overview of, of where this idea came from, uh, because I think it's very much related to Web3 developments and, and a lot of the things that we see going on today um, in distributed ledgers, for example. And so this is a photograph that I took in 2019. It's what now five years ago. Uh, and the gentleman at the podium, his name is George Strawn. And back in the day, he was the director of something called the NSFNet. And what George is doing here is he's saying, happy birthday, internet. Because back in 1969, uh, already the idea of the core technology of the internet, TCP, IP, internet protocol, was being developed. Uh, and that went through a period of, of research uh, for 20 years, uh, went into more of a development mode um, for 10 years in this project called NSFNet. The, the, uh, the objectives of NSFNet was to connect, uh, I think, the local computer networks of about 100 different universities um, to make them interoperable. That was, at that time, uh, you know, very much an engineering challenge. What George had noticed by the year 1995 was that many of the users of this otherwise academic, you know, government-funded network, many of the users had been, uh, had become private industry. And all of a sudden, there was a lot of commerce happening on this academic network. Um, so by the year 1995, a decision had been made to hand over the government-funded in infrastructure to the private sector. And that's usually where we consider the origin of the internet in 1995. Um, in that same year, interestingly, ironically, in 1995, the inventor of TCP IP, Robert Kahn, wrote a paper called A Framework for Distributed Digital Object Services and this paper was anticipating a time when the new internet would have so much information on it and the data would be so complicated and so voluminous that um, it would be lost unless machines were better able to assist humans in finding it. Uh, and so uh, Bob Kahn was really laying out the plans for uh, you know, a vision for a new infrastructure. He called it um, distributed digital object services and that digital objects, so uh, you know, basically digital content of, of any variety, could be made uh, more searchable and accessible and retrievable on this network. And of course, this is what, 30 years before the idea of FAIR ever came along. But in fact, he was anticipating a time when, when um, you know, uh, there would be so much information that humans would need assistance. Otherwise, the, uh, the, the ability to connect all this information might be uh, somewhat meaningless. By the years, you know, 2016, um, there was already clear indi indicators that we had reached this point of data overload. This is just one snapshot. This is uh, a lot of surveys were conducted around this time showing that 
Already by then, data scientists were spending 80% of their time in basic, uh, you know, uh, pedestrian level data munging operations. And that would leave about one day a week left over for real creative uh, research on data. Um, and then also there was a, you know, a very nice study by PricewaterhouseCoopers. This was commissioned by the European Commission. And, uh, you know, the question was, how much does it cost Europe uh, to have its data in a non-fair, you know, environment? And the answer was, uh, at that time, 11.4 billion euros per year were being lost in these data inefficiencies. Um, so there was clear indicators, there was a clear uh, interest at that point that, you know, something has to be done because uh, the, the cost of having data munging uh, is just too enormous and too much is being lost. Uh, this issue was addressed head on in a, in a workshop in 2014. The workshop was at Leiden University at, a, at an organization called the Lorentz Center. And it's where this FAIR acronym had been born. Um, if I skip ahead, uh, you know, in January of this year, 2024, we had another Lorentz workshop that was really kind of a retrospective, looking back over the last 10 years of FAIR and looking forward to the next 10 years. And this is because we've seen an enormous uptake uh, around the FAIR principles since they were uh, conceived in 2014. Um, this is where they were first published. And in 2016, there was a, a commentary in Nature Scientific Data that introduced this idea of the FAIR guiding principles. And very much embedded in this commentary was the idea that, the, that FAIR is about enhancing the capability of machines to automatically do FAINR. The FAIR principles themselves were introduced as a simple figure item, box two. Uh, it's these 15 one-liners that um, uh, just laid out some high-level principles that would enable machine actionability, uh, but there was very little said about how they should be implemented. Uh, and then this is just to indicate that, you know, this is from, from Google Scholar. I, I took this snapshot today. This is really showing, you know, this incredible uptake uh, around the FAIR principles. So it's, uh, we, we seem to have found, uh, uh, an, an, you know, a, a, a pretty serious pain point in the data ecosystem. And FAIR is at least a, a framework, offering a framework on how to address it. <clears throat> But the principles are one thing, their implementation is something <clears throat> altogether different. In 2018, the GoFair initiative was launched as a way to try to coordinate or catalyze this translation from principles into implementations. So let's take a little bit deeper look at the principles themselves. And, and that gives us a clue as, as you know, how we can, in a more systematic way, go about their implementation. So here's box two from the original publication. And you see these 15 one-liners. Uh, from a high level perspective, we can say, well, one thing you might notice right off the bat is that there are uh, clear indications and, and a clear need for metadata throughout the FAIR principles. It's really fundamental to FAIR. And it's not just metadata, it's not just a thorough description of your, your data and services, but it's machine actionable metadata. So it's somehow semant semantically enabled um, encoded metadata statements that allow the machines to really interpret um, <clears throat> not only um, kind of the, uh, uh, the implementations that they're looking at, but also the content within them. Uh, some of the principles we can partition, uh, we call them the red principles. These are principles that are addressing more technical aspects of FAIR. Uh, these, and I think of these more as like infrastructure elements of FAIR. And I think Web3 technologies fit extremely well into these red principles, or they can fit extremely well there. Um, so this is to say that, you know, Web3 technologies could provide a generic 
uh, and powerful infrastructure, I think, to enable FAIR. But this would require, at the same time, that there are um, domain-specific and kind of community-specific content that could be made also addressable within that infrastructure. So you see the word community actually enters into the FAIR principles. And in fact, we can um, color other principles here um, in blue, which is referring to this uh, uh, kind of domain-specific and community decision-making that's needed around the content of the information and the services that you want to make FAIR. So uh, this combination of of like, let's say like Web3 red technology with the, uh, you know, trying to encode the, the, the knowledge domain information from the blue principles uh, would be a great combination uh, going forward, I think in the Web3 space. It's also helpful to really sharpen your understanding of fairs to say what fair is not. So fair is not a standard. It's a set of very high level principles to which many different standards could be applied. And that's important. Um, in the last couple minutes of the presentation, I'll, I'll show how standards can be um, uh, uh, fitted into the FAIR principles in a very systematic way. Um, but FAIR is maybe in some ways heavily dependent on a semantic description of data and content um, but it's not only semantics or linked data. Uh, FAIR is also these, these other control factors, these red principles that enable or orchestrate uh, the FAIR data. And FAIR is not equal to open or free. This is often conflated, but we should be very careful not to do that. Um, <clears throat> at GoFAIR, we certainly promote the idea that uh, data should be, by default, as open as possible and as restricted only as necessary. But we do appreciate the fact that there's a large amount of data out there that even for research purposes could be highly valuable, but will never under any circumstance be made open. One great example of that is, for example, patient data, patient medical records, which um, is an incredibly powerful uh, data set if you can access it, you know, you can even run virtual clinical trials for a fraction of the cost of real clinical trials. Um, but that's all privacy sensitive data and, and can't be made open. However, FAIR, uh, you know, envisions and, and promotes the idea that data can be accessed under highly specified conditions in a machine actionable way. Um, so this is actually also, I think, very close to ideas around Web3. Uh, but it's to say that FAIR very much addresses the idea that, that some data cannot be open, but could still very much be FAIR. And lastly, I just wanted to flag the idea that um, uh, FAIR does not explicitly address issues of data quality or trustworthiness, um, but it is believed that by making your, date, your metadata machine actionable and very rich, um, that you could better infer trustworthiness and data quality and fit to purpose um, by, by good fair, uh, fair metadata descriptions. Um, but of course, trustworthiness is, is very much a part of Web3 technologies as well. <clears throat> okay, so with that as the background, um, let's talk a little bit more about implementing fair. And in the Go Fair Foundation context, you know, we work with this really broad spectrum of stakeholders. So very high level organizations like funders and publishers and very low level organizations like, you know, research laboratories that are actually creating uh, very, very specialized types of data and information. Um, <clears throat> so we needed a, a broad framework that could coordinate and support verification efforts no matter where, where organizations were on this, on this spectrum. Um, so if you go to the GoFair Foundation website, there's a high-level menu item here that describes each of the FAIR principles in more detail and offers a kind of interpretation, what we're looking for, what we're trying to achieve uh, in each case. And these interpretations are very much um, a bottom-up exercise that's ongoing in GoFair where the community can contribute to um, uh, 
uh, to an interpretation. What is it? What exactly are we aiming for for each of the fair principles? And these interpretations have been made much more rigorous. Um, in fact, there is an ontology now that we have where we describe um, um, in, in as precise detail as possible uh, what's needed for each of the fair principles. And so here's a summary of that. You know, we have the fair principles on the left. Uh, we have for each fair principle, we've been able to define a type of fair enabling resource. So a kind of technology that's required in order to implement each of these principles. And we give definitions for those as well. Um, but this, <clears throat> these definitions and this ontology helps us to conceive of a very standard reporting mechanism for how it is you want to implement FAIR in any particular case. And we call this a FAIR implementation profile. Um, there's an early manuscript we wrote on this. Uh, I'm referencing it here. But the idea is basically that for any particular community, community of practice, um, they can enter into a collective decision-making process where they will decide for each and every FAIR principle a list of FAIR enabling resources that they're using. And so many different communities may go about this in different ways, choosing resources that best fit their own specialized situation. Um, but then we end up with um, a very standard way of understanding the FAIR implementation profiles uh, for these different communities. Those can be compared and contrasted, and hopefully we can drive um, you know, smart decision-making and interoperability uh, on the basis of these, these profiles. So here's a quick and easy way to start building your own FAIR implementation profile. We call it the FIP mini questionnaire, and you can link, you see the link at the bottom of the page. Um, this is just a, a list of the FAIR principles. And then there's a prompt in each case asking you for, you know, what is the technology of choice needed to implement those principles? We give a reminder about what the, um, you know what, I'm wondering. <laughs> okay, so sorry about that. So um, so indeed you see then that, that we, we give um, each of the, um, sorry about that. We You can see that we give a reminder to each of the fair enabling resources. And this prompts you to write down the kind of technology that you want to use in your implementation. This is a handy way to get introduced to the idea, but we have a much more sophisticated tool that allows you to capture your fair implementation profile uh, in a machine actionable manner. So we, this tool called the FIP wizard um, is harnessing a, a, a technology called nano publication where we can really capture in a very precise way, a semantic and fair description of the FAIR enabling resources that you are, are using for each of the FAIR principles. And when we capture your FAIR implementation profile in this context, uh, what's created is actually a, um, uh, a machine readable output that looks something like this. What you see is a, basically a, a list of um, globally unique, persistent, resolvable identifiers that compose a list of technologies that point to a list of technologies uh, by which this particular community is, is choosing to implement FAIR. And what's interesting about this approach is that uh, all of this information exists on a decentralized nanopublication server network such that you can go back later and query for all the FAIR implementation profiles that have been created and all of the FAIR enabling resources that, um, uh, that were used to create those FAIR implementation profiles. So we have a complete picture of the technology landscape of the FAIR ecosystem. Uh, and you can access this information at a portal that we call FAIR Connect. And this is just uh, an interface that we built on top of this decentralized nanopublication server network. Um, but here you can actually search and retrieve FAIR enabling resources or entire FAIR implementation profiles. Um, and uh, if you use the FIP wizard, you can also contribute to this information. 
Uh, I will leave it there. So I'd like to say thank you for your attention uh, and for this afternoon. Um, I bid you farewell.